Hi folks, welcome to EA Unplugged. I'm Freeman, Battlefield's Community Manager, and joining me around the table, we've got some of EA's top creative minds from some of our action and shooter studios, as well as members of our Game Changer program. We're going to be talking about our action shooter games today, talking about how they got made. But let's introduce everyone. So let's start with Drew. I'm Drew McCoy. I'm executive producer on Apex Legends at Respawn, and I've been with the studio since the beginning. I'm Adam, one half of 200 Gamers, Twitch streamers for about five or six years, and I've been with the Game Changers since Battlefield Hardline. Um, I'm Moonlight Wolf. I go by Moonlight Wolf. <laughs> um, I'm a mixer streamer, and I play a lot of FPS games. I do Anthem, I do Apex, I do all of that. And I'm a sound engineer full time. Okay, to my left. Uh, I'm Ben Irving. I'm the lead producer for Anthem. I've been at Bioware for about eight years now. Lars Gustafsson, uh, currently producer in Battlefield in Stockholm, Dice, mm -hmm. Sweden. I uh, have been with the franchise since the very first prototype in 99. It's really my life <laughs> in a nutshell. Making games is hard. Like, how do you start? What, what, what is that spark that you get in that creative process? Uh, at Respawn, it's actually a really iterative, prototype -y process. We're very design driven. Every designer would take a week at a time and try and make something. It could be anything. It could be a weapon. It could be a level idea. It could be an AI. It could be an encounter. Anything. And we made hundreds of these things, played them, rated them and came up with ones we thought were really cool, and that eventually turned into the Titanfall 2 single player. And then Apex was born out of a prototype that two guys did, and then more people were like, that's really cool, and we were playing it every day, and it was getting better and better, and we're like, okay, now this is the game we're making. And it's not a repeatable process. Every game is its own wonderful mess. So basically, you start basically with freeform prototyping and see what, what goal is to be found. Yeah. And then you shape a game around it, rather than start with, here's a great idea, Let's see what we can do. It depends on where the process is. So if we knew we were making Titanfall 2, we knew we wanted single player. Yeah. We had done some bigger prototypes that had spanned like multiple people, weeks, months, whatever. And it, those ended up feeling like not a great use of our time. So we kind of reset and said, okay, we need to find a lot of cool stuff really fast. Whereas the one for Apex was more of a, hey guys, we worked really hard on Titanfall 2. We worked really hard on the post-launch support go have fun and find whatever you want. And there was some crazy, crazy, crazy stuff made. <laughs> uh, but Apex is the one that ultimately stuck. Like in that process, does it leave like a lot just like on the floor that doesn't ever come to light? Yeah, certainly for Anthem, that's yeah. true. I mean, I think, you know, there's lots of great ideas out there and I think part of the challenge is the execution of it, right? And um, I'm sure everyone works on kind of big teams and one challenge we have a lot is, you know, you have this great idea and then it's like, how do you get, say, hundreds of people to like deeply understand that same thing? So when they're all making their decisions every day, how are they always making the decisions that support that vision and that idea that you have? I don't think anyone's ever shipped a game and said, we did every single thing we wanted to do in this game. Like, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so you leave things on the table with this hope that one day you get to bring them back into the game. With regards to live service, how different is it now compared to 10 years ago? There's a cost that comes with shipping. No matter how small, you could ship a one line change to fix a bug that still has to go through an entire process of making a build, getting it tested by your internal testers, hanging it off to you know certification, all these other things. Yep. Like what could seem like, oh, that'll take like an hour, right? Ends up taking like two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you wish that, okay, I've done the fix. Go. Submit, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, users right. have it, but we're not the, there yet. The standard's higher as well, I think, than, than 10 years ago. You know, I remember playing games 10 years ago and after a patch, things didn't work and it was just part of life, the servers were down. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not tolerated anymore. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of good, like, because of that, we do have more checks and balances. It takes more time to do certain things and, and it's hard to explain that context because yep. it can feel like excuses and, like, we just mm -hmm. want to make a better game as well. And so... So we just shipped a patch this week on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Monday night, we found that the way we had added localized dialogue to the game triggered some form within one of the first parties during CERT. And so it put us at risk of shipping on Tuesday morning. Yeah. And so we had to go out and put a little you know, note to the community saying, hey, we know that you guys are expecting it. We didn't say what time today, but it's later than we wanted to and you were expecting. So yeah. we've had some last minute issues. Bear with us. Ended up shipping it you know, four or five hours later. And some of the community was like, this is ridiculous, unacceptable. Yeah. I'm like, eh, you don't want to throw a first party under the bus. Um, right. You know, we should have caught it in testing, perhaps. Like, there's all these things that. Yeah. So you don't want to be doing that. You can't but, give that context often, right? Yeah. yeah. That 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 gave rise to a conversation internally where I was talking with our community manager Jay about how do we talk about this, and so we put up a post like, here's the bugs that you guys have found. This is our response to it. Yes, we think this is a bug, we're fixing it. No, that's intended. Like, we go line by line yeah. almost the things people are talking about. We're trying to build a live stream studio at Respawn so that 
we could sit down and like load up and build a game, and load a test map and show off skins or things. Like we want to find ways to kind of close that gap a little bit mm -hmm. and not try and have to make everything so ultra polished, you know, triple A, like, no, we're just a bunch of people working in an office. Here's the stuff yeah. we're making. We think it's cool. Do you think it's cool? Like help us kind of guide it along the way and yeah. try and make that relationship more real. I was talking to some people at, at Apex. They told me it can take up to a year to create a character. More. We've never made a character in under that 14 months. That blew my mind. And I guarantee like a majority of the Apex community is no, not. No, it's usually a year that. and a half to make a legend. Yeah. Like after playing a week, people are like, cool. So when's what the new else? map? Yeah. Yeah. When's yeah. the new character? Like yeah. when am I getting Kings Canyon took us yeah. uh, about 14, 16 months. Each character is 14, 16, yeah. 18 months. This is all great information. They just don't have that knowledge. Your earlier question about how has live service changed things? Mm -hmm. The first eight characters, we did them all simultaneously. So they could like rise and fall in, in, in progress along the way, knowing they all got to hit this date. Now we're like, we got to have a character hit a date constantly, every, every few balancing. weeks. And balance you have it. Classes, so yeah, you have to worry about balancing. Yeah, and play testing time is a huge pain. Like we spend three hours plus a day play testing and we can't play test enough. We can't yeah. get enough testers the in our matches. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Three is, hours. And that, that's where we balance, that's where we tune, that's where we decide what's really good and get more resources to that. Oh, that's not working, put it on the back burner. Um, but then now we have, what, four or five hours a day to actually create stuff? Yeah. And like there's this constant push and pull of time and not doing stuff in batches, trying to kind of pipeline things. So we have, mm -hmm. we have a bunch of characters all hitting different milestones every month type of stuff. Um, and that's a learning process for us, and it's been difficult. It's interesting, like, like 14 months. Kings Canyon. We're at about what nine months for a battlefield map on average. Depends on. I mean, especially when you go to a new biome, you want to see what are the leaps we want to take this time around. And and as everyone else, you definitely know, <laughs> you will fail. It will take steps back. And yeah. we have levels. I was talking about one from uh, Battlefield Three. It was called uh, Omaha Desert. We played it for ages, and it's kind of it's almost there. It's almost there. We never got there. So it's kind of okay. We have to pull it. I think we did the maps for Battlefield 1. Uh, how's your French? Uh, Nivelle Nights and, uh, and uh, Prix de Tri. Prix de Tri. At least a two-a-year. <laughs> <laughs> Those, I think, the team did in two, three months. Uh, extremely talented team, but they had all kind of the... the, the they had the assets. The, they had the assets and basically take whatever shortcuts you want. And I think they delivered super cool maps. Yeah. So it's all kind of how much are we pushing new boundaries versus how do we just allow, allow ourselves to be creative. Yeah, and that's two like multiplayer arenas on this side of the table, but then Anthem, mm -hmm. this is a world. I mean, how, how, how many iterations do you go through to get the world? <laughs> I mean, the world took a long time for Anthem. We wanted to add flight to the game. Like, flight's a really important part of Anthem and the heavy traversal. But, like, it seems like a lot of games don't do flight because it's a pain to work out, like, what about quest structure? What about, like, uh, level design? And, and how do you, our lead level designer phrased it as creating a Swiss cheese was kind of the map of, like, how do you reuse all these things? And then how do you not get upset when someone just flies over it real fast? <laughs> and so like creating... This. <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're really smart about it. The team, you know, they would just create, like, quests that this quest loops around here and you fly over this, but the next quest takes you to the midpoint. Right. And because you flew over it, like it doesn't feel that familiar when you come back to do the objective uh, in the end. So that took a lot of, of time and um, the payoff was really meant to be, hey, but flight feels so worth it. Like, can we work this out? Honestly, we haven't really solved it for the world itself. Like we're, we're adding lots of new content, but we're doing lots of instant stuff. So like strongholds, like our dungeons, you know, mm -hmm. or the cataclysm is something we have on PTS now that we're playing. Uh, but at some point we want to extend that world and we spent a lot of time talking about, well, we want to do a new biome, are we going to go do more photogrammetry? Like we've set this high standard of quality of the art in our game, which a lot of it actually worked with Dice in Sweden to help us out with that um, about two years ago probably, um, as kind of the, the experts on using Frostbite to make it look amazing, which, which was great. You know, and then you have to layer in, well, for a game like ours, like progression systems are a big part of it. And I think, you know, we're pretty honest with ourselves, like our progression systems aren't as good as we wanted them to be. And I think if you can nail that though, and the game's more replayable, then you can reuse the same environment. Like Apex, it's great, it's a PVP centric game, like map mastery, same with Battlefield, map mastery is a, a huge part of that. And so I think you get the benefit of probably not having to ship things as frequently as say a PVE centric game. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you run that content treadmill and incentivize with rewards and make things replayable and systemically replayable and it kind of just becomes this big puzzle to solve. And 
all the way back to the question of like, how do you provide insight to that? That's what I struggle with the most to share with players is like, it's like the sum of a thousand decisions. And so like, how do you explain the thousand? It's like, I don't even really remember some of them. It's just, you just know that all these things happen and that's why we made a certain decision. And, and I don't know, that's complicated, I guess. And if you don't get it right, <laughs> then it becomes a content consumption as opposed to like yep. for a game like yep. Anthem where, yeah, if you just do it all once, like, there's no way, physical way to keep up content-wise. That's why yep. systems that make reuse usable yeah. is yeah. so important for that type of game. It's also interesting how the world have changed where, yeah, old days, box products and, and uh, we had an expansion later on, but we, it was still kind of a big gap in between. But now you're starting to think much more about kind of what beasts you have created, mm -hmm. where you kind of started to build a game and whether it's extra animation or extra, you know, we, we always try to make it as immersive and, and, and kind of getting the feel for it as possible. But it also means that if we're going to do more of it, it's going to be so much more kind of expensive. So it's almost at times you, you miss the good old days with 1942, <laughs> where, you know, you had a list of vehicles and 2,400 polygons for an airplane. You'd kick it together in a week and off it goes. Uh, but now it's, it's uh, I mean, just, just hearing what it takes to do a character. <laughs> so it's, uh, sometimes you can miss those old days where it was just easy. <laughs> you could easy. pump out content and, and try things. Yeah, there was a bunch of uh, consternation early on in Apex because we wanted the ping system to be fully voiced by all the characters. Yeah. And that's a ton of dialogue. Yeah. Like when when localization that got well, like is so good that you got it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's now set yeah. a new standard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that was a lot. That was like that's a, over a thousand lines of dialogue per character. And if you had a new gun or a new thing, there's the problem. Yeah. And yeah. that's why yeah. every piece of content, or like we want to add, like let's say the jump towers, the balloons. Let's say those weren't in the game at launch, and then we modeled it in a week because it's just a balloon, and hooked up the script and code. Took another two weeks, whatever. It's done in a month. Oh no, now you gotta be able to ping it. So now we gotta get all those actors back into the booth. We gotta write probably 30 lines per character and then have them do two or three takes that we like yeah. per, per line. And it's like, that made the ping system ultimately as good as it was, but that was a conscious decision we had to make of like anything we add to the game now has this giant burden, this tax on top of it just for VO. And that's, if you make those decisions without thinking through that, yeah. you paint yourself in a corner so incredibly fast, you're like, oh, we can't ship anything. At some point, you gotta just trust the intuition of your team, if it's experienced, to help you through that kind of stuff. But it's just, content's crazy. I remember with 1942, where we showed it at E3 before we launched, and it was kind of, people went crazy and super cool, but uh, Patrick uh, Sutherland and Johan came back and said, you know, it doesn't look good enough. And we kind of, but it's 64 players, we can't make it as, uh, as good looking as I like Assault. Yeah. It was kind of, there's no way, but it's kind of, no, players won't care. They won't they care that care. you have 64 players. They want it to look equally good or better. And uh, so we worked hard during the summer. I'm not sure if we reached it, but we definitely did our best. So. There's so many factors to, to kind of bring into it in, in how you work. And then as you said earlier, you've got other companies raising that bar whilst yeah. you're working. Yeah. Yeah. So. E3 is just as exciting for us as everyone else yeah. out there, because we're like, how in the world did yeah. they do that? Oh God. So the short version then. Video games are hard, <laughs> but we love doing it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We love doing it. You have to be passionate though. Like, like, I don't know how you would survive doing it if you weren't passionate. Like, there's yeah. so much tough stuff between all the creative friction and the timeline budget, whatever. Um, and so I think passion has to be everything. Otherwise, I, I just do something. Why would you do something easier that probably pays more money? Like, there's just no need to do this if it's not what you live and breathe. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know. Uh, Well, everyone, thank you for this chat. This is magnificent. Um, and thank you to everyone for watching. Thanks for watching AA Unplugged.